The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Hello, Caltech alumni and guests. Looks like the sound is working. We're so glad you're here for seminar day uh, and to celebrate the 2013 Distinguished Alumni Awards. You, all our alumni, are amazing scientists, inventors, leaders, entrepreneurs, and educators that change the world. I'm very proud to be part of this highly selective uh, community and network, and I hope you are too. Current research being done on campus is laying the groundwork for the inventions and the innovations of the future. Not that we necessarily pay attention to rankings, which come and go, but it is factual that the Times Higher Education Survey of World Universities, I said this once before, but it bears repeating, uh, that survey uh, did rank Caltech as number one for the second straight year. And of course, these things come and go, but it's nice to recognize it when it comes. Uh, it, it's now my honor to introduce to you the eighth president of Caltech, on whose watch this occurred, Dr. Jean-Louis Chameau. Thank you, Jim, and thanks for reminding us of that ranking. Why not? <laughs> uh, welcome, welcome home, welcome to Caltech and to the 76 alumni event, Seminar Day. I would like to welcome the class of 1963, who are newly inducted members of the half century class. I would also like to welcome two Caltech Trailblazers, who I believe are here today, maybe not in a room, but I think they are here today on campus, Stephanie Charles and Sharon Long. If you are here, please stand. They're not here, but. They were, they were among the first four women to receive their, their degrees from Caltech. <laughs> they are celebrating uh, their 40 years reunion, and Sharon was a past DEA award recipient. We are alumni who have traveled from England, France, and many states, like Texas, Virginia, Hawaii, New York, and many others. It is a testament to our stronger and better connections to alumni around the world. Caltech is a unique place. The Caltech advantage is grounded in giving everyone at the Institute the means and flexibility to pursue his or her best ideas. We accept the best students, we hire the most talented professors, and once they are here, we give them the support and freedom to follow their curiosity. In 1929, uh, Einstein spoke to a reporter about the confirmation of his theory of relativity. In the interview, he described how he was not surprised when the eclipse of May 29, 1919 confirmed his intuitions. That would have been, he quote, I quote, surprised if I was wrong. <laughs> Bit of a Caltech flavor there. The interviewer goes on to ask him about the importance of imagination. To which Einstein responded, <clears throat> I am enough of the artist to draw freely upon my imagination. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. Imagination and curiosity are, I believe, wired in the DNA of Caltech, its students and alumni. Your curiosity is what made you stand when you applied to Caltech, and it is likely what distinguishes you now in your career. It is the imag imagination of people like you, coupled with your intelligence and tenacity, that has led to transformative ideas in the world. So when people ask me what I am most proud of during, of during my tenure as president, the answer is simple. I am proud of you and the entire Caltech community. In the past seven years, I have met some of the world's greatest intellectuals, 
educators, risk takers, problem solvers, and humanitarians. You, as Caltech faculty, students, and alumni, are the envy of our peers. In 2012, our alumni achievements were celebrated around the world. Uh, Carver Mead was awarded the National Medal of Science. Philip Hanlon was selected as the 18th president of Dartmouth College. Sarah Elgin was elected to the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Pete Tysinger, working for JPL, was named one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people. He landed a small spacecraft on Mars. Okay. <laughs> Caltech faculty and alumni, like Christopher Hirata, Kevin Tang, and Rebecca Waschenfelder, were awarded the Presidential Early Career Award. Caltech scientists participated in the discovery of the long-sought Higgs boson, and many of them had amazing achievements. Over the past few months, Francis Arnold received the National Medal of Technology and Innovation, Sarkis Masmanian became one of the MacArthur Genius, the, the MacArthur Foundation Fellow. We had five faculty members who were elected to the National Academy of Engineering and National Academy of Sciences. And our students are also winning major fellowships and scholarships, like the Gates Cambridge Scholarship and the Churchill Scholarship. Our people are really the stars. Those are all achievements to be proud of. But make no mistake, it is those people, those who from time to time bend the rules, those who value the usefulness of knowledge that may appear useless to others, and those who run towards the problems that others would stay away from. They are the ones who define the Caltech advantage. You always have done that and you always will. Big ideas are perfected in a cross-disciplinary landscape of Caltech. Cross-disciplinary research in energy, the environment, medical science, information, information science, robotic exploration, among others, are solidifying the Institute's impact on the future. A number of you, I think, attended the previous lecture by uh, um, Professor Lewis, Nate Lewis, and I'm sure we'll be impressed by the work being done in energy here as one example. But big ideas are not limited to research. Over the past few years, we have also enhanced our, our education and learning environment. Programs such as the Innovation in Education Fund, changes to the core curriculum, launching of freshman seminars, the creation of a center for teaching and learning will all continue to benefit our students for years to come. I'm also grateful to four of our professors, Antonio Rangel, Harry Lester, Yasser Abu Mostafa, and George Gorgowski, who eagerly joined the experiment uh, called MOOCs, those massive online open courses. It's an experiment. It's an experiment, but I think it was exciting to see four Caltech professors in, in, involved. I think this experiment in a long, in, uh, has a potential to have some significant impact and expand Caltech's reach to the world. And also the way people teach. Uh, Antonio Rangel, one of those professors, who taught the principles of economics for scientists, remarked that he will never teach the same way again after the experience of having tens of thousands of students interacting with him. Also this past year, and I, I mentioned it casually uh, earlier by uh, referring to Pete Tysinger, uh, Caltech, JPL, on behalf of NASA, we landed the Curiosity rover on Mars which I believe is inspiring a new generation of scientists and engineers. I see in the room here one of the Caltech alumni, Charles Elachi. Charles, please stand and be recognized. <laughs> Today, the Mars rovers have has half a million followers on Facebook, and every day there are hundreds of messages being sent by those fans. This achievement by our colleagues at JPL and on the campus, on the campus, uh, uh, John Grotzinger, professor in geophysics, is the lead scientist for the entire program, 
has re-energized, I believe, the world's passion for science and space exploration. It is just one example of the strong, stronger than ever partnership between campus and JPL. It is a connection I'm very proud of. Today, there are 10 space projects that include campus in participation. Six, six professors are based at JPL. There are five joint science centers and more than 100 joint campus JPL appointments. JPL is not, a, is not just Caltech's jewel, it is a shining diamond in the world. The, the campus is stronger because of JPL, and JPL is stronger because of the campus. This relationship should never be compromised. As I will leave Caltech in a few weeks, I would like to thank you for your service and dedication to this institute. You are the greatest champions of Caltech, and my job as president has been made lighter knowing that I have had a partnership with you to promote Caltech throughout the world. I encourage you to continue supporting the Institute, whether it is by giving of your energy, your resources, or by simply forwarding a Caltech web story to a friend. While Carol and I will leave this beautiful campus, we will always consider ourselves part of the Caltech family. Now, I'm pleased to join you in celebrating our distinguished alumni who have achieved the highest honor the Institute can bestow on its graduates. All of our recipients are being recognized for their exceptional achievements. They are inspirational stars in the Caltech family. So we're going to now to start with those, those awards. The first awardee is Dr. Juris Hartmanis, who received his PhD in 1955 in mathematics. And he's receiving the award for his groundbreaking contributions in the field of computer science. He's unable to be with us today, but let me share a few words about his career. In the early 1960s, he asked a question which appeared impossible to answer at the time, could there be a quantitative theory of computation? Together with his colleague Richard Stearns, he studied computation focusing on Turing machines. Inspired by a lecture on noise reduction, Juris and Richard began to imagine whether they could mathematically quantify the efficiency of computing. The result was a seminal paper on computational complexity published in 1965. In it, Hartmanis and Stearns introduced the time hierarchy theorem, codifying exactly how a machine, given more time, could solve more problems, and they defined classes of computational complexity. It was a seminal, a seminal paper in computer science. Their work ultimately earned them a Turing Award in 1993 for helping establish computer science as a formal discipline distinct from mathematics, physics, and electrical engineering. As I said, Juris is not here, he's not able to join us today, but please join me in applauding him for his achievements. <clears throat> Our second award goes to another Caltech pioneer, Susan Wu, who was the first woman to earn a PhD in aeronautics from the Institute in 1963. And throughout her career, Susan has overcome personal challenges and distinguished herself as a leader in, in, in industry. Uh, we were having lunch today, and it's quite remarkable when you meet her and her husband, her husband also received a PhD at Caltech, to find out about their days at Caltech and how they, they received two PhDs, raised children, and did all those things. And, and it, life was not that easy, so, but you did amazing things. She has inspired a generation of students as a faculty member at the University of Tennessee Space Institute and launched a successful company in the late 80s. I should mention that she shared with me yesterday, you know, 1963 is only 50 years ago, that in those days, she and her husband were looking for jobs after they finished their PhDs. And most universities in this country had a policy not to hire couples. 
And the University of Tennessee was one of the few who was a bit more open-minded in those days, allowing the hiring of couples. Times have changed, for the good. <laughs> our company, our startup, which focused on aerospace, defense, and information technology, is now an economic engine in over five states with over 700 employees. We are very grateful that Susan still credits every time she speaks or experience at Caltech with teaching her how to approach and solve difficult problems. Please join me in celebrating Susan Wu as a 2013 Distinguished Alumna. Please join me. Dr. Hemo, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, I'm really humbled by this uh, award. I, I know there are many, many talented uh, alumni out there, and uh, I am just a very small person. <laughs> but anyway, I want to thank the uh, education I received from uh, Caltech, which certainly changed my life. And also, I received a very special gift I will talk to you later. And uh, first, let me uh, thank my nominators and the nominating committee to make it possible. And then, there are many people who have helped me along the way of in my life journey. Last but not least, I want to thank my family for their unconditional love and support. I'm sure I have neglected them many, many times because of my studies or, or my um, work, because my two sons were born when I was a graduate student. You probably can imagine I didn't spend a whole lot of time with them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I graduated in 1963. In 1962, I developed a um, breathing problem, and I didn't know what that was. Uh, after I went to see the doctor, I, uh, the doctor sent me to a cardiologist, found out I had the congenital defect of my heart, which required uh, open heart surgery. And also that was the time uh, open heart surgery was relatively new and uh, very danger, dangerous. And of course, the, I always had problem of uh, the financial, how do I, uh, uh, how do I pay for it? So it took me a considerable amount of effort to find a company that will pay for the pre-existing conditions. That was the first time I heard something called pre-existing condition. Nobody want to hire somebody who came in want the surgery. I finally found a company in Pasadena called the Electro Optical Systems. Actually, it was founded by a Caltech uh, graduate, uh, Abe Serum, and. Uh, I had surgery. Before the surgery, I, the insurance company informed me something completely out of my imagination. I need to provide 13 pints of blood for the surgery because uh, apparently after the surgery, my body had to change to new blood. Uh, where do I get 13 pints of blood? As always, as I think students, when they have problems, they go back to their advisor. So I went to my advisor, Lester Lees, that I need 13 pints of blood. <laughs> he and the executive director of uh, the aeronautics division, and uh, together they twisted the people's arm or pleaded, I don't know what they did. Uh, Caltech apparently has a blood bank, which I didn't know either. They were the one who provided me 13 pints of blood. So I have Caltech blood flowing in my body. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, I also owe 
Caltech blood. <laughs> Thank you. Don't steal doors. <laughs> Pre pre existing conditions is still a topic of discussion <laughs> many years later. Our next awardee is Sebastian Candel. Uh, we received his uh, master and PhD here at, uh, at Caltech in, in, in mechanical engineering, PhD in 1972. During his career at Caltech, Sebastian Candel's research focused on aeroacoustics, aeroacoustics, and today we honor him for his extensive and pioneering technical contributions to aerospace, the, the aerospace field. He has published a number of seminal papers on combustion, combustion theory, advanced rocket combustion processes, and computational aeroacoustics. Throughout his career, Sebastian has remained a very curious and lifelong learner. His contribution to the fields of combustion, aeroacoustics, and propulsion inspires generations of students, and he continues to do so for years to come. He is a member of the US National Academy of Engineering and the French Academy of Technology. Please join me in celebrating Sébastien as a 2013 distinguished alumnus. Good morning, everybody. I'm very honored and humbled to be in this distinguished alumni group at Caltech. I should thank my nominator, Jean-Francois Haas, for taking the initiative to convey my name and to have been so convincing. Thanks also to those who supported uh, this proposal, and in particular, I know that uh, Anne Karagosian, who is here, a professor at UCLA, and Charles Elashi, who we just greeted uh, before, uh, who is the director of JPL, well, they, they were also supporting me. And uh, I should also say that my wife, Danielle, who is also here, deserves to be cited for her loving support for a respectable number of years now, <laughs> and uh, for adopting Caltech and its consequences. <laughs> it is a pleasure to be on campus under such circumstances and reconnect to Caltech my source of inspiration and momentum. I need to give a small explanation for having spent so many years to study flames. It is again Caltech with its beautiful seal featuring an idealized torch and flame. It's all over the place. You've seen it time and again. And the flame is meant to represent science illuminating the world. But the flame is also a subject of scientific uh, interest on its own, which deserves a bit of attention. Not just the simple flames of current life, like that shown on the Caltech seal, but the more complicated ones, which are used in aircraft, automotive engines, gas turbines, rockets, and power plants. Please remember that without combustion, little would fly or operate. Combustion provides much of our energy. Civilization began with combustion. And like, com uh, like civilization, combustion, but to a lesser extent, is complicated. In practical, applications, flames are turbulent. And you know Richard Feynman, one of the famous Caltech Nobel Prizes who I met on campus when I was here? Well, he said that turbulence was the most difficult unsolved problem of classical physics. You can imagine the turbulent combustion is even more difficult because you, it adds up the complexities associated with turbulence with those of the fast exothermic reactions defining combustion. And so it makes a problem which is twice as complex. 
The situation gets even worse when you look at uh, combustion in cryogenic rocket engines as the pressure is pushed to extreme values and the working fluid becomes transcritical. I did not know all that when I started working in this field with my mentor, Frank Marble, who I met a few days ago, uh, again, but was bold enough and all fired up. I learned that this is the sentence which translates from French, tout feu, tout flamme, all fire, all flame. Well, that defines me a little. So uh, it has been much hard work to make a few steps forward, but you were kind enough to consider that they were sufficient to become a distinguished alumnus of this institute. Many thanks again, and my best wishes to all of you. Thank you. You know, uh, I love the French. <laughs> they, they, they always enjoy a little bit of philosophy, and you found out that uh, combustion is really at the beginning of, of humanity. Huh? That's, why, that's, that's why we're here. Uh, by the way, Sébastien, I put you on the spot here. There is a very active group of uh, alumni of Caltech in, in France, especially in Paris, and they meet regularly. And they, invite, they, they have asked me to invite you to give a lecture to that group. And I hope that you're going to say yes right now in front of all those people. <laughs> <laughs> so yes? OK. <clears throat> By the way, since we are among friends here, you know, I mentioned Charles Elachi earlier. Charles and Sebastian were, were roommates, apparently, at, uh, at Caltech in the late 60s. And I understand if you want to, to hear interesting stories about Caltech, in those days, you should talk to both of them. They were part of those stories. <laughs> Our next awardee is Uma Chaudhuri, who received a master's degree at Caltech in 1970 in engineering science. <clears throat> She's recognized for a distinguished career as a researcher and global business leader. Uma's experience at Caltech led her to the field of material sciences, an emerging field at the time. She led a team of researchers at DuPont to produce supercomputing oxide ceramics. This led to more than 20 patents and numerous publications and numerous industrial applications. In 2006, the DuPont company recognized her in, in her leadership and appointed her as chief science and technology officer for the entire global company. And she demonstrated again her tenacity to succeed, launching a global effort to take DuPont into the emerging economies of China, India, and Brazil. She has continually created new paradigms in her life as a researcher, leader, and mentor to young researchers. Please join me in celebrating Uma Chaudhuri as a 2013 Distinguished Alumna. Thank you, President Chamo, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you to the nominating committee for giving me this incredible award. I'm immensely honored and deeply humbled to be ranked among the distinguished alumni of this prestigious institution. When I received a letter from the president saying I was going to be recognized today, I was shocked, and I do realize what a special privilege it is to be in this group. I'd like to congratulate each and every one of my fellow 2013 awardees. Their accomplishments are extraordinary, and I feel very special to be in their midst. I want to express my gratitude to my husband, without whose constant encouragement all through my um, career, I would not be standing here today. And 
thanks to the many years he has suffered through uh, the ups and downs of a taxing career. I want to thank my parents who encouraged me all through my youth to go out and get the best education the world has to offer. Those words from my father constantly ring in my ears, especially today as I appreciate how fortunate I was to be admitted to this great institution and to graduate from it. As I was growing up in India, I had heard of the great universities we have in this country, and I became more determined than ever that I was going to strive to study at one of the best, with Caltech, MIT, Harvard, and Princeton being at the top of my list. I knew the probability of being admitted here at a time when women and minorities didn't often receive such privileges was very small, but I was determined to try. You can imagine my joy and elation when I received a thick envelope in the mail one fateful day in Mumbai, telling me I was not only given admission to graduate school, but also a scholarship to, that would enable me to devote my energies to science and engineering and allow me to graduate without a heavy financial burden. I was completely dumbfounded. That summer of 68 changed the trajectory of my life. And I have Caltech to thank for it. I could not have asked for a warmer welcome by faculty and fellow graduate students here. For a school that had not admitted women in the undergraduate school before the 70s, I found the atmosphere at Caltech incredibly warm and incredibly friendly. While I struggled at first to keep, the, keep up with the coursework here and found it intimidating in the beginning, I learned how helpful the faculty were and how willing my peers were to take time out of their busy schedules to help to, and to encourage me to remain tenacious, disciplined, and to experience the joy of learning. My housemates, one of whom was Dr. Mary Baker, who I think is in the audience today with her Caltech alumni husband, Wayne Pfeiffer, they all, my housemates, provided a wonderful environment to make my stay here truly memorable. And with the encouragement of Professor Paul Dewey, who said to me that if I was a little curious about materials, he would make me far more curious. And so began the flame that kept alive throughout my career. I embarked on an exciting journey into the mysteries of material science and the challenges of learning to control the microstructure of materials, especially their evolution during processing. Understanding the relationships between the microstructure of materials and their bulk and surface properties for important problems facing today, that became my goal. The seeds of how to approach problems, what questions to ask, and seek help when needed was sown here at Caltech and they have helped me overcome challenges throughout my graduate school at MIT, and finally, through my corporate management career at DuPont. Commercialization of technology to create societal and economic value became my passion, and I have to say a big thank you to Caltech and that provided me with the confidence to achieve my goals. So as I reflect on the grand challenges facing the US today, the biggest assurance to national security as I see it is the preservation of our uniquely superior source of competitive advantage, namely our university system. I am preaching to the choir on this, but the lack of appreciation of the power of science and technology by significant sections of our society and policy decision makers in particular to continually fuel our innovation engine is a big challenge that we face. And our role as alumni is to speak out wherever and whenever we can regarding the virtues of our university system and the talent that they generate. Thank you so much for this kind award. And I hope my life's journey can serve to encourage young women and minorities to dream courageously and to follow their dreams. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Uma. Our next awardee is Stephen Wolfram, and he's a man who is not afraid to tackle big problems and big ideas. He has made significant contributions to the fields of computation and physics, and it is his passion for solving problems that causes him to stand out as an innovator. In the early 80s, he created the software company Mathematica, which is considered, not is, the prime software language environment for scientific, technical, and algorithmic computation and software development. Using his intuition and imagination, Stephen Research has offered new insights to understanding computational complexity. He has also received recognition for his book, A New Kind of Science, and for launching a new computational knowledge engine, which he hopes will improve everyone's access to systemic knowledge immediately computable. True to the Caltech culture of interdisciplinary research, he remains fascinated by the intersection of nature and computing and hopes to unlock even greater mysteries in the future. Please join me in celebrating Stephen Wolfram as a 2013 Distinguished Alumnus. Well, that, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think uh, my, my history with Caltech is, is uh, perhaps an interesting one. I happened to get interested in science pretty young, and I was a kid growing up in England, and uh, I thought physics is really interesting. I should learn about physics. In those days, there wasn't the web, so you had to bicycle through a university library to find uh, the books and so on to, to learn about these kinds of things. But by the time I was 15 or so, I had gotten far enough with physics that I was starting to publish papers about physics and, and things like that. Uh, I briefly went to college in England um, and decided that uh, I really needed to uh, keep doing more physics research, and I, so I should go to graduate school somewhere. Uh, I had, uh, uh, so I contacted various universities in the US and so on, and uh, some of them said, oh, we can't have a, a student who doesn't have a college degree, can't, can't be in graduate school if you don't have a college degree. Uh, actually, Princeton and Caltech were the, the two uh, universities that said, no, it's okay. You published a bunch of papers. Uh, uh, there's some evidence that uh, you might be able to do research kinds of things. Well, I, I had visited Princeton. I had not made it to California, so I thought, I'll do the more adventurous thing. I'll, I'll go to California and, and come to Caltech. Uh, it was one of the better decisions that I made, I think. Uh, I arrived at Caltech when I was uh, just, just turned 18. Um, and uh, I, I was, uh, uh, came to the particle physics, theoretical particle physics group. At that time, uh, the fourth floor of Lauritsen Lab was kind of the center of the world of, uh, of particle physics. It was an exciting time, lots of, um, lots of discoveries being made. Um, I uh, uh, got to the point where um, I was very kind of uh, revved up by all of that, and I think my, my period of peak productivity was producing um, one paper every two weeks. Um, I was particularly happy when the Higgs boson was discovered, and I looked at uh, sort of the data analysis that had been done for that, that uh, a paper that I wrote when I was 19 years old during that one paper every two weeks period was, ended up being used for that, uh, some of that data analysis. So that was, that was encouraging that it survived. Um, <laughs> So I'd written a whole bunch of papers. They actually made a fairly thick pile, and I said, OK. Uh, people said, you should turn that into a PhD thesis. So I said, OK, great. I'll collect uh, all the papers that I've written and, and make that into a PhD thesis. Turned out that was, um, I don't remember how many hundreds of pages, but um, it, was a, it was a big, thick, thick pile of paper. And the people who were on my uh, thesis committee said, you can't have a PhD thesis that long. We'd, we'd actually have to read all these papers you've written. <laughs> uh, um, so, so I simplified it, um, and uh, uh, my PhD thesis was the short papers that I'd written during that period of time. Um, now, I, I, I should have made the effort to, uh, to get my PhD while I was still a teenager, and, and it would have been great if somebody had given me the advice. That would be a really cool thing to be able to, to tell people you'd done uh, later in life, but, but that didn't happen. So, so I, was, I was 20 years old when, when, when I got my uh, PhD. 
And I remember that, that um, uh, actually, I was uh, uh, recently, there was a young woman, maybe a year ago, two years ago, uh, who I'd actually known for a while, who, who um, got her PhD at Caltech at the age of 20. So I was very curious, we were both curious, um, who, who was the winner in terms of uh, uh, the, the, you know, how old they were. And I, so I, I went and looked at my PhD thesis and it said November 1979, didn't have a date. And it turned out the date actually mattered in determining who was, who was the winner. <laughs> But I remembered one thing. I thought, how, how, am I, how on earth am I going to find the actual date? I remember one thing. I was doing my PhD thesis defense, and I was actually in the middle of having this kind of argument with Dick Feynman about something to do with thermodynamics. Um, and uh, there was a little earthquake that happened, which I thought was an interesting sign. I don't, I don't know. But so now, uh, many years later, I'm able to go back and look in Wolfram Alpha and say, you know, earthquakes in Pasadena in 1979, and up pops, you know, 2.13 p.m. or something on a particular day. So, so I was able to date that. And it, it, it uh, uh, turned out I still, at least by, by thesis defense date, I was still the winner, although, although not by... Um, uh, so after, after, um, uh, after that, I... I um, uh, uh, I had been long interested. I'd been doing physics, but I'd also been doing things with computers, and I was, was never very good at doing sort of uh, algebraic calculations of things, and I had, been, uh, had become sort of the world's largest user of systems that people have built to do algebraic computation. I decided I need to do more than what existed, and the only real way to do more than what exists is do it yourself. So I started building a software system uh, for doing mathematical computation, and um, uh, I did that at, at Caltech. Um, by, after I got my PhD, I uh, became a faculty member um, and uh, did, this, did this project. Um, I, it was, um, uh, and it went very well, and um, within a year and a half or so, we had uh, produced this, uh, this actual software system that I realized I was going to be very useful to me. It was also going to be useful to lots of other people in the world. Well, then that, a problem arose, because in those days, this was... Um, 1981 or so, the idea that uh, sort of faculty members at universities would start companies and things like that, that was a very new idea. Um, but it was the only path that I could see forward. Well, the result of that was that uh, there was this, this horrible mess, which you can, I, I learned just a few days ago, actually, that the, uh, that the Caltech archives that are now on the web contain a few pages about the Wolfram affair, um, <laughs> which, uh, um, which has at least one, one side. It's not, not quite accurate, but um, uh, it's, um, uh, in any case, the, the, um, so the result of that was that um, uh, I, I'd kind of thought, you know, I was having a great time at Caltech. I thought I'll just keep on doing this for, forever, but um, uh, the result of that was that uh, sort of unwound over a period of time. While it was unwinding, I said, well, I've been doing all this particle physics stuff and computing, but actually, let me do some things that are more fun. So I ended up um, uh, starting to work on, on things called cellular automata and starting to work on kind of a question that I'd long been interested in, which I thought was fun, of sort of how does complexity arise in, in nature and so on. That turned out to be something which was later kind of a defining theme in, in a lot of science that I've done. But anyway, the final moment was uh, some moment in the, as this whole mess unwound. Um, the, uh, at some moment, I just said, okay, I quit. I'm giving two weeks' notice. I'm out of here. It was the, actually the, the first vacation I'd ever taken and arguably one of the last vacations I'd ever taken. And I, I spent the two weeks actually learning to fly small airplanes at, um, at a, through the Caltech uh, Flying Club, as I recall. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, so that was 31 years ago. And um, uh, I had... Um, uh, I thought, uh, you know, if, if things had worked differently, I probably still would be working at Caltech 31 years later. Um, as it turned out, um, uh, uh, I, I did not. Um, and, but I've had a, I had a great time doing other kinds of things. And um, it's, uh, I suppose it's the, um, uh, it's the more meaningful um, to be uh, back receiving this very, very nice award. Um, uh, given sort of the, uh, uh, the, the up and down history. And I'm, I, I should say, I'm, because as I told you, I didn't get a college degree or anything like that, uh, this award is particularly valuable because it is the only possible alumni award that I can get. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. You know, Stephen, uh, uh, Caltech is very good to you because if you had not left at that time, you wouldn't, or if you had stayed here as a, as, as, a, as a professor, 
I wouldn't be able to give you a distinguished alumnus award. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a degree yet. Now you have a degree, so you should be very proud of it. By the way, I noticed that you know, it's not, uh, not unusual to have PhD students who have to simplify their work for the, the committee to understand it. <laughs> and by the way, how times change. You know, in 1981, it was difficult to start a, a corporation as a faculty, and now, every year, Caltech is creating as many startups as uh, MIT or Stanford. So a dramatic change in that time, thanks to you. Show the way. <laughs> Our last awardee today is James Fructerman, who received his Bachelor in Engineering in 1980 and a Master also at the same year in Applied Physics. He's a champion of social entrepreneurship, and he develops technical, technical products and method that can benefit society. While at Caltech, Jim was inspired by, with the power of philanthropy and began a journey that has changed the lives of many people. He was excited to develop his idea, to develop technologies that can benefit society. And he first channeled his entrepreneurial spirit to develop a text reader for the blind. That led to the formation of a startup, Calera Recognition System, that developed breakthrough optical text recognition technology and yielded significant commercial applications. But that was not enough for Jim, and over the next decade, he has leveraged his talent and passion to serve others, launching Benetech, a nonprofit specializing in adapting commercial technology to help the disabled. Today, Benetech has been a catalyst for human dignity, and its initiatives have created positive outcomes on global literacy, the environment, and human rights. Jim exemplifies the, human the humanitarian spirit of scientists and engineers around the world. Please join me in congratulating Jim as a 2013 Distinguished Alumnus. Thank you very much for this award. Looking at the list of the distinguished alumni is, is a humbling experience, and it's many of my heroes, and I want to join in congratulating the other 2013 distinguished alumni. alumni. And uh, I especially want to thank my family, especially my wife, Virginia, who has learned for almost 30 years what it's like to be married to a Caltech guy. <laughs> <laughs> So Caltech was founded to give back to society through science and engineering, to discover knowledge and to apply knowledge. There was tremendous optimism about the value of training engineers and scientists and how that would benefit all of humanity, especially in the Southern California of a century ago, which was reshaped through the wonders of technology. Caltech's small size makes its faculty and students incredibly agile when it comes to understanding a broad array of fields. There's a need here to be able to explain your work and to understand the work of others. That's the Caltech advantage. Richard Feynman once tried to reduce an advanced physics concept to a freshman lecture. When Feynman found that he couldn't do so, he said that that meant that we really don't understand it. The first lecture I heard at Caltech as a freshman was delivered by Feynman on the topic of liquid helium-3. And I was sure that he did understand the topic. <laughs> However, being a Caltech freshman makes you confident for the rest of your life. If someone can't explain something to you, that means they really don't understand it. Caltech feeds an intense curiosity, a burning desire to understand, to grapple with hard problems, and to own them. As Feynman said when asked about winning the Nobel Prize, the prize is the pleasure of finding things out, the kick in the discovery, the observation that other people use my work. More than anything else, the pleasure in finding things out 
has been Caltech's gift to me in my career as an engineer, an entrepreneur, and a social entrepreneur. Whether it's been turning optical pattern recognition for targeting missiles into reading systems for the blind, building the largest online library for the blind and dyslexic, doing the analysis for the United Nations to determine how many people have actually been killed in the civil war in Syria, to assisting in the dramatic trial of the former dictator of Guatemala, who was convicted of genocide just last week, to matching up volunteers from Silicon Valley's top companies with open source social good projects, the team at Benetech, the nonprofit tech company that I founded and have the privilege to lead, is fueled by these Caltech values. The thrill of solving problems, of figuring something out, and bringing that understanding into the service of humanity. However, my concern today is that technology professionals have drifted in the last century away from directly applying the benefits of science and technology to the needs of all humanity. The need to get practical, to find a business model that will deliver massive financial returns to investors means that many great ideas get put back on the shelf when the inventors realize that they don't fit the venture capital model. Now, as a successful tech entrepreneur, I've benefited from California's incredible venture machine, which creates immense value for individuals and for, and for society. And of course, from its founding, Caltech has been a testament to the generosity of donors who have been successful in business. But we can't fully realize the promise of Caltech and institutions like it if we only market our products to the richest 1% or 5% of humanity. It wasn't too long ago that our pharmaceutical industry was more or less arguing that people with AIDS in Africa should die rather than to license their technology for inexpensive manufacture. I want to advocate for giving the sleaze off your vest strategy. Top tech companies like Facebook and Google and IBM have all figured out how to make massive quantities of money giving away their core product or building it on top of open source and free software. Keep the business focus on those top markets that generate venture capital returns, that feed our successful business enterprises, but allow the benefits of technology to reach far beyond the top of the pyramid. To the greatest extent possible, be open. Support open data, open access to research, open content, and open source software. When I ask the owners of intellectual property to license their creations to my nonprofit for free for these markets where they've already decided they can't make money, they say yes 80% of the time. People are immensely proud of their intellectual creations and would love to see them used and benefit more people. Think of the freedom that can be promoted by greater sharing of the benefits of science and technology. Freedom from hunger, from thirst, from illness. Freedom from ignorance, illiteracy, lack of education. Freedom from human rights abuses and from tyranny. If we can do that by being as open and sharing as we can be, we'll better realize the founding values of Caltech and its motto, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Thank you for this honor. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, thank you for reminding us that the Caltech mission, which has not changed much since 1920, is to conduct the most exciting, the most important research, scientific research, integrated with education to benefit society. The last three words are, very, are sometimes forgotten. Thank you very much. This is the end of the formal program for the Distinguished Alumnus Award. And I would like you to give one more round of applause to an, an amazing group of distinguished alumni. <clears throat> Jim, the floor is yours.